Hey guys, and welcome to this message from Church on the Move, Broken Arrow. We're so glad that you joined us today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of three churches in Northeast Oklahoma. We've got incredible teaching and worship, not just for you, but for your kids and students as well. If you live near one of our locations, we would love for you and your family to come check it out and experience it for yourself. If you got any questions, you can drop a comment below or check out churchonthemove.com for more information. Let's jump into the message. Welcome to Church on the Move this morning. So thankful that you're here. Honestly, like all of you, we're so grateful for you that you're a part of our church family. What God's doing in these days is really cool really significant, and we're just thankful you're part of it. My name is Ian. I'm one of the pastors around here. Before we talk about what we're going to talk about today, I want to tell you where we're headed next week. Next week, we're going to kick off a series called Upon This Rock. Maybe you've heard that phrase from Jesus where he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In days that are shaky and uncertain, God is building something solid and unshakable. And we want to partner with him to be his faithful people in these days and partner with him to build what he wants to build. And so we're going to kick that off next week. We'd love for you to be a part of it and come, come prayerful, come expectant. Today, uh, I have a word on my heart that God's put on my heart for us, for you, for your family, and for our church as we move into this next season. We're going to cover a lot of scripture today. And so if you don't have a Bible, but you want one, we would love to gift that to you as our gift to you. You just throw your hand up in the air. Our team uh, is walking through the aisles. Did you guys ever go to that restaurant like Lamb? where they like throw the rolls at you. That's kind of what's happening in this moment. If you need a Bible, throw your hand up. Uh, and if someone next to you needed a Bible and you get hit in the face with a Bible, we're so sorry. We'll lay hands on you at the end, pray for you. Anyway, if you need one, we'd love to gift that to you. Uh, we're going to be in two major places today. The first is Song of Solomon. The second is Matthew 15. Now, if you're familiar with scripture, when I say Song of Solomon, you might be like, where are we going this morning, Pastor Ian? Is it about to get sexy in church or what? Like this is... I thought we finished the marriage series. I thought we were past that. Why are we going backwards? If you don't know, if you're new to Scripture, Song of Solomon is actually a love song that's recorded in Scripture. It's like way before Taylor Swift, Biebs, all that stuff. This is like ancient, beautiful language in Scripture. It's like the most... Uh, I don't know, PG-13 plus book in the Bible. There's stuff in there that's a little raunchy. We're not going to cover those parts. As God's people, when we look back at this song that is written by King Solomon to his bride, what we're meant to see deeper than the practical principles of love and intimacy, what we're meant to see is a letter from Jesus to his church, his bride, his people. And so the words that we'll read, I believe, are his words to us. And so we're going to start there. Song of Solomon, chapter 2 is where we'll begin. Verse 10, my beloved spoke. This is what he said to me. Rise up, my love, my fair one. This is what Jesus calls you, by the way. If you've ever wondered, I wonder what Jesus thinks about me. I wonder how he sees me. When he looks at you, what he calls you is my love, my fair one. He's got scars in his hands right now to prove how much you matter to him. Fair means you're washed clean, righteous in the eyes of God. God has made you a new person. And so when Jesus looks at you, he says, my love, my fair one. But then he says this, notice this, and come away. For us, as we see this, we know this is our great hope that the day is coming when Jesus, the one who loves you perfectly, is going to split the heavens and say to his bride, come away, away from what? All the heartbreak on the planet, all the suffering and the pain and the agony that God never intended for humanity, Jesus will come again and he'll say, come away and we'll get to be with him forever. In fact, right before Jesus was crucified, he sat down with his disciples in an upper room and he said this, he said, you believe in God, believe in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me that where I am, you may be always. Jesus said he is going to return again. He's going to come back. The day is coming when he will speak to the people he loves and say, come away. And notice what happens in that day. He says, lo, the winter is past. 
the rain is over and gone. My wife, Jess, uh, has been reading to our boys the Chronicles of Narnia. I don't know if you've ever read these before or seen the movies from C.S. Lewis. Maybe the most famous one is called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And C.S. Lewis takes language from here uh, when he's trying to describe what the world is like under the power of the wicked one. He calls it a perpetual winter. He says it's like it's always winter here, except there's no Christmas. Like it's the worst without any of the good stuff. Nothing grows like it's supposed to. Nothing is fully alive like it's supposed to be. And here the scripture is saying, Jesus says, when I come and say, come away, that is all past. It's over and it's gone. God will wipe every tear from every eye. There will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain ever again because God will make all things new. He goes on to say this, flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. Isn't this what we see in Revelation when we finally get to be face to face with our God? What's our response? We sing, we worship. Worthy is the lamb. Holy are you, Lord, because we see how good God is and all that he's done. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Like when Jesus comes back, stuff's even going to smell good. Like everything's going to be the way God intended it to be from the very beginning when he makes all things new. And then he repeats this phrase, rise up my love, my fair one, and come away. Here's the word that God's put in my heart for us. This is approaching the day when Jesus will say, come away. But for his people, before he says this, he first says this, rise up. And we are living in times where I believe Jesus is looking at his people, at you and at me, and lovingly saying, the time has come for you to rise up, to be everything that God created you to be, because this is meant to give us joy. We'll be with Jesus face to face but it's also meant to sober us, to remind us that we will stand before the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, give an account of the life that we've lived, and our hearts long to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. We wanna be like those servants Jesus talked about, that when the master comes back from his journey, we're found doing what he called us to do. And so Jesus says, I'm coming again, but until then, it's time for the people of God to rise up, to live awake and alert to what God is doing, to partner with him, to build our homes and our industries the way that he created us to so people can see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Rise up, he says, and then come away. When I played uh, hockey in Canada, my first year up there, We were underdogs going into playoffs, but in the first series, we had a huge breakthrough. We beat the team, and it took us six games. It was a seven-game series. Game six, we won. We advanced to the second round. Second round, we played the best team in the league. These guys were good, number one seed. Because they were first, they had a bye in the first round. We, on the other hand, were coming off of a six-game series. We took them all the way to game seven, and I remember sitting in the locker room, about to go on the ice for the third period, Last period of the game, if you're not familiar with hockey. We're sitting in there. We are exhausted. We've played 13 games in about three weeks. There's like guys in there. One dude, his nose is like all like weird, bent out of shape. Other guys are like, coach, I'm fine. I'm fine, coach. Doing great. Like this was us. And I'll never forget the coach walked in. This guy, he was an incredible, like legit coach. This guy played for the New York Rangers. Amazing, like NHL style hair. He walks in. That wasn't important to the story, but I just remember thinking, I wish my hair did what his did. It never did. Anyway, you don't have to write that down. Okay. He walks in and he says, boys, you've already made it further than anyone thought you could make it. But if you've got anything left in the tank, don't you bring it back into this locker room. You leave it all out there. And we're like, let's go. We're like walking onto the ice, people exhausted. Like we're going to, you know, that feeling, right? of like when the clock's ticking, I don't care how hard that guy hits me. I don't care what they throw at us. We're bringing everything we got because the game's on the line. This is the imagery that's given. Clock is ticking. The Savior will come back. He'll make all things new. But until then, we should be living with like a fourth quarter mindset. When I went to college up, I went to college up in the Northeast back in the days when Tom Brady played for the New England Patriots. These were difficult times as a Cowboys fan. And I remember 
every Sunday. Sunday was one of my favorite days of the week. It was the one day we didn't have practice, and it was the one day that we were allowed to break from like the heavy nutrition plan that we were on. And so we would just like gorge ourselves. We would order, there was this like burger joint right down the road from our school. I would always order uh, burgers. We'd get wings and pee. We would just feast because it was the one day we were allowed to. No practice, nothing. And I would throw my Tony Romo jersey on for a couple reasons. One, to support my boys, but two, because it was a little bit bigger and it like gave me space to like eat as much as I wanted and still feel good about myself. And so we would do that and I would watch the games and deep in my heart, I knew what you know, if you're a Cowboys fan, they're going to let me down. Okay, it's what they do. And it's okay. I still love them anyway. This is like a me and Jesus kind of thing. Like I will love you always, even to the end of the age, regardless of what you do. And so I knew that was going to happen. So deep down, I had like an ulterior desire. And it was just that the Patriots wouldn't win, like that they would lose so that I could walk into the dining commons with my Romo jersey on and be like, yep, you're one of us this year, right? This is, you know, you know how it feels. And so every week I would kind of like ignore the Cowboys, especially when we got into the playoffs and the Patriots would be playing. I would be all quiet, like in the dorm room, like watching, thinking like, okay, maybe this is the week they're going to lose. And they would, they would get into the third quarter and they would be down. And I would think this is it. This is my moment to gloat over my friends. And then the fourth quarter would come, and if you've seen this, it's, it's like Groundhog Day. Every week was the same thing. Tom Brady would like choose to clock in for the day, go to work, turn the whole game around, and they would win. And I would sit back and go, why do you do this to me week after week? There's certain mindsets when you know the game is on the line. It's Tiger on the back nine, MJ in the fourth quarter, LeBron sometimes in the fourth quarter, right? <laughs> No disrespect. No disrespect to our younger people. LeBron's legit too. But you know the mindset of like, it's game time and it's game on. This is what the scriptures are pointing us to. Will we rise up and live with intentionality and focus and purpose in these days to make the most of the time that we do have, to redeem the time, as Ephesians says, because the days are evil. I went to Israel about five years ago with Jess. While we were there, day one, we're sitting on the Mount of Olives, which is a mount that Jesus taught from that overlooks the city of Jerusalem. We were about to go into Jerusalem, and there's a path you take to get there. They call it the Palm Sunday Road. And they say this is where Jesus rode the donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And so we're like, this is so cool. We're taking pictures and all stuff. And as we start to walk down this road, all of a sudden I get hit with this like unexpected sense of emotion. Like as I'm seeing like all that happened in this place, I'm thinking of Abraham who brought Isaac, his son, to this mountain range, thinking this happened like here. I'm thinking about how David slaughtered the giant and literally carried his head into the city of Jerusalem, like right here. Better than all of them put together, Jesus riding into the city, knowing he would be crucified, slain for you and for me coming into the city. And as I'm thinking about all this history and all that God had done, I'm struck with a sobering moment. Like the Holy Spirit was nudging me saying, yeah, son, all that did happen here. But today, you're standing here. Those were the stories that were told about them. But what stories will be told about you? They ran their race. Will you run yours? And I had this sense, rise up. Step into the story that God has been writing for centuries. Be who he created you to be. And so this is the word of the Lord to our church. It's time to rise up. Step into the high call of God on your life. The question then is, how? What does that actually look like? And what is it that God wants to do in us so that we can? That's where Matthew 15 is where we're going to go next. This tells the story of Jesus ministering to people. These are real people who experienced real healings from Jesus. But what Jesus did for them physically, I believe he wants to do for us spiritually. So we're going to look at this story and see what God is saying to us. Jesus, Matthew 15, 29. Jesus went on from there and he walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain, and he sat down there. Great crowds came to him, bringing with them, notice who they brought, the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and they put them at his feet this is a really generous translation. That word everywhere else in the New Testament is translated throw. It's a little bit of an aggressive word. 
the idea is they lugged these people up the mountain like, we don't know what to do. Like, no one can help these people. So they just thrust them at Jesus' feet. Like, as if they weren't injured yet, they are now. Jesus, heal them. And that's what he does. Jesus, like always, he healed them so that the crowd wondered. They were astonished when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. This is what God wants to do in us. He wants to work in us so powerfully that people can see it. And the only reasonable response is to give glory to your God because they see the wonder that God has worked in you to transform you, to change you from the inside out in a way that you really do rise up and become who God made you to be. People can see it. They know it and they glorify your God. So we're going to look at these people what Jesus did for them and see what he wants to do for us. The first is this. They were astonished when they saw the mute speaking. People who previously had no voice, had thoughts, had opinions, had a perspective, but they couldn't express it because they had no voice. When they came into contact with Jesus, he gave them their voice back. And we're living in days where God wants to give you a voice where your words have weight, where none of your words fall to the ground because God holds them up, where you have influence in places that no one thought that you could, where God opens doors for you to speak into the lives of people and into situations and people actually listen because God's given you a voice. You see this in scripture over and over again. When God's people are in godless societies, guess who gets incredible favor and influence? Joseph in Egypt becomes a ruler. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are in Babylon and God gives them a seat at the table with the most powerful man on the planet. And the guy listens to what they have to say. Esther, Mordecai in the kingdom of Persia, over and over again, God opens doors for people. Yes, to share the gospel. Yes, to share your testimony, but also to be a difference maker in your industry, in your school system on your team where people look to you because you always have the wisdom of God in your words. You have the counsel of heaven in what you say. And people go, man, when they speak, what they say is right and it resonates with me. God wants to give you a voice. Can I tell you beyond just this like current cultural moment, God wants to give you a voice in your own home. Have you ever felt muted before? Like with your kids where you're speaking Like your mouth is moving and you're thinking they're not hearing anything that I'm saying. I have. God wants to restore your voice in a way that you go, man, I'm walking with like the authority and the voice that God wants me to have. But before our voice has weight with people, the first place Jesus wants to give us our voice back is with him. You remember the scripture says Jesus increased in favor with God and with people. The voice that God wants to restore to his people, the church, maybe more than any, is the voice of prayer, where we begin to be bold in our prayers to ask God to work in a way that only he can. Peter said it like this, 1 Peter 4, verse 7, says, this is what we're talking about, the end. Jesus is coming back. The end of all things. It's near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. Why? So that you may pray. Use your voice to ask God to work. I went to Uganda about eight and a half years ago with Jess. We had been asked to speak at a pastor's conference there. Why? I don't know, but we were. We show up and they're telling us about the guy that's running this conference. And this dude was a legend in the area that he was from. This guy had had a radical conversion to Christ and he wanted to offer the rest of his life to serve Jesus. And he had. He had launched over 70 churches in this area. This pastor's conference had a couple hundred pastors at it that he had, every one of them, personally won to Christ, trained for ministry, and equipped to lead the churches that he had started. Like documented miracles from this guy's ministry. So much so that there was a couple people there that said, hey, we like confirmed, we watched it happen. He had even raised a couple of kids from the dead. Like New Testament stuff. And we're there like, why are we speaking? Like, I want to hear from this guy. I don't want to be like the guy. I want to sit in the seats and take notes and listen. But they wanted us to. So either way, we went up, we ministered to the people, loved the people. And at the end of it, we got to have dinner with this guy. And I was like, I was ready 
I had questions that I wanted to ask him. One of the first things I asked him is I said, hey, what's, like, what's your secret? What's something you do that no one else knows about but you know that's led to this incredible fruitfulness in your ministry? And he said, oh, brother, no, no. I am the same as you. And I was like, ah, I mean, I get it. Like in Christ, we're the same, but like... <laughs> Like, I've never, I've never raised anyone from the dead. Like, that's not happening where, like, it's not happened for me. And he's like, no, brother, I'm the same. I'm like, ah. And I kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing, till finally he said, okay. He said, I've never told anyone this, but for the last, like, 20 years, three to four times a week, I get up between 2 to 3 a.m., and for the first four hours of the day, I pray and I intercede for my country. You could see his eyes begin to fill with tears because God loves these people and they're drifting further from him but I know if God could do it for me he could do it for them so I pray that God would send laborers into the harvest field I pray that he'd soften their hearts I pray that he'd work miracles I pray that he would send us and I ask him to give me wisdom and ideas and as he's sharing this I'm like oh that's it that's it that's rising up in prayer using his voice with God I was looking at my, and I don't say that sort of like condemn us. I mean, I, I've prayed at 2 to 3 a.m. a few times recently, but those prayers are not for America. Usually they go like this, Lord Jesus, put that baby to sleep, Lord Jesus. Help him fall asleep. And if that's outside what you're capable of, Lord, wake Jess up in Jesus' name. She's better at this than I am, right? These are my like middle of the night prayers, okay? So no shame. I actually, I got back from that trip, and the first day we were back, the jet lag was so bad that I couldn't sleep, and I just happened to wake up in the middle of the night, and I looked, and it was 2 a.m., and I was like, oh, I'm doing it. I'm being led by the Spirit. I prayed for America for four hours. Obviously, it worked. And then, I'm just joking. I fell asleep. Next day, slept like a baby. I have not done that since in the last eight and a half years. I don't tell you that to condemn you. I just say that to spur us on to go, what could happen if we started to use our voice a little bit more in calling on God to move? This is what the prophet Habakkuk prayed, Habakkuk 3, one of my favorite verses. Habakkuk lived in a day and a time that wasn't too different from our time. He had a rich spiritual history, but all of the wonderful things God had done were not happening in his day the way that he saw it happening in the scriptures. So he prays and he says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Then he says this, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. God, we want to see you do in our generation what you did in the past. The same mighty wonders of God where people's hearts are open because they see undeniably God is real and he loves people where they taste and see the goodness of God in the land of the living. God, do that kind of stuff again. What could happen if we started to pray boldly like this? Then he says this, in wrath, remember mercy. In a time where the appropriate response when God looks at what humanity is doing to turn against him, the appropriate response would be wrath. But Habakkuk says, remember, you're a God of mercy, that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. The further people drift, the further you're willing to go to rescue them, save them, set them free, for you came to seek and save the lost. That's who you are. And he prayed that God would work. What could happen if we rose up in prayer and used our voice to call on God to move like we know that he can? Psalm 5 says this, in the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice, the voice you've given me. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you, and then I'll eagerly watch because I'm expectant that you're going to answer. That's the first thing. He wants to give us a voice. The second thing is this. They were astonished when they saw the crippled healthy. These were people, the, the word that's used, it speaks to being wounded or something being deformed so that it's not growing or functioning the way that it was supposed to. For you and for me, you may have been through something recent or a long time ago that is holding you back from rising up and being the follower of Christ that God intends for you to be. Jesus wants to heal you from the inside out, set you free so that you really can be whole, fully alive, and step into all that he has for you. I'll tell you a story from my own life. About five years ago, I was starting to get really frustrated because there was something that had been happening in my life. It had been happening for a long time. 
but I hadn't like seen it as clearly as I did about five years ago. I was really confronted with it. For whatever reason, when I was with my peers, I could be completely myself, free, fully, like fully me. But when I would get around leaders, people that like oversaw me, had authority in my life, I would just like, I would shut down. Like I just, I wouldn't say anything. Like inwardly, it was like I would just hide. And it was bothering me because God was being good and God was opening doors for me to be at the table with people here at the church, pastors and leaders. And I had thoughts and opinions, things I felt like I was supposed to say, but I could not say them because I would get in the room with a seat at the table and I would just shut down. And it started to frustrate me. And I started to pray like, God, why, why can't I just be myself? What's keeping me from like just being me? And as I prayed in that season, I was reminded of a story from like one of my earliest memories. I was in preschool and I, I should tell you before I tell the story, I was a little bit of like an unsanctified toddler, just if I don't judge me when I tell this story. This was before real Jesus time, but I used to always go at it with the teacher. And there was one day in particular, she got onto me and I responded to her by telling her that she had ugly hair and a fat bottom. Yeah, I told you, hey. Real Jesus came later in my journey, okay? This is pre all of that. She responded by bringing me to the front. I got swats. Side note, you're like, if we have a lot of younger people in this service, they're like, what? Yeah, this was the last century. This was par for the course, okay? <laughs> then I got sent to the back. I still remember this. There was a barrel in the back with a little hole in it, and then like a little eye. It was like solitary confinement for preschoolers. Yeah. Again, some of you are like, yeah, I spent some time in the barrel. You remember that. This is I, uh, one of the young guys in our church after the last service was like, did you grow up in the 1800s? I was like, no, this was like 91, man. This was a good time. Anyway, I got sent back to the barrel. I'm looking through the little eye hole. <laughs> yeah. And this teacher, after already kind of humiliating me in front of the class, is ridiculing me from the front yelling at me, saying things about me. And I remember seeing the kids turn back, look, and laugh as I'm sitting in this little thing. Now, I don't blame her. I was a turd, man. And I, like, I can only imagine what she must have been feeling. But as God reminded me of that story, it was like all of a sudden I could see from that moment forward, every time I was around leaders, I would just go like this. And I thought, well, that's just stupid. I don't want to be shackled by something that happened Back in the 90s? <laughs> Come on, it's a new century, Lord Jesus. So I started to pray and invite God in, and God began. It wasn't like all in a moment, but little by little, it was like, I can be me around everybody. For you, you may have been through something way worse than the barrel. It's pretty bad, but man, I'm just kidding. But if you have, listen, if you have church hurt, even being in an environment like this where you're just like, this is, this is hard. I don't know if I trust what you're saying. Jesus can set you free. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Whatever you've been through, whatever you've experienced, if you will just be humble enough to go, Lord, I'm bringing this to you. Can you heal the places of my heart that I don't think anybody else can? He can, and he can set you free so that the crippled, you're no longer crippled. You can be made healthy and rise up and live the life God's called you to live. Psalm 147 says this. He heals the brokenhearted, no matter how broken it may seem, and he binds up their wounds. That's the second thing God wants to do. The third is this, the lame walking. Pe this doesn't mean like these people are just lame and now they got some vibe about them. No, like their legs, their feet. That was such a bad joke. Thank you, Cherie, for laughing at it. Anyway, didn't use it in any of the other services and I won't use it in the next one. Okay. Their feet didn't work. The picture of feet in the scripture is the authority that God gives you to go where God's called you to go. Because God has a purpose for your life, but there is opposition to you fulfilling that purpose. And so God puts power in your feet. So like Jesus said, you can trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You can go where God's called you to go. And in this current moment that we live in, it is so easy to embrace a victim mindset, like you're just waiting to see what happens around you. But God wants to put power in your feet so that you say, if God's given me a step to take, 
It does not matter what's happening out here. I can take the steps he's called me to take because he orders my steps. He makes my footing firm and secure. He wants to give you strength to walk out the call of God on your life where you realize I'm not just waiting to see what happens. I'm making stuff happen because you're a child of God and the spirit of the living God is in you. This is what God told Joshua, Joshua 1. Joshua had a big assignment. Moses, as God said, is dead. But then God tells Joshua the same thing he's telling us this weekend. Rise up, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, the people of Israel. This was their destiny, their purpose that they had waited over 400 years to step into. And the time has come. There's just one issue. The promised land isn't empty. There are enemies that don't want them in the land. For you, God has a divine destiny for your life, for our church. And he's calling us to rise up and step into it. But there will be opposition and battles. But notice what he tells Joshua. Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, even if it doesn't seem like it, just as I promised to Moses. God wants to give you your feet back so you can walk where he's called you to walk, where you go, this makes me a little nervous, but God's given me a step and I'm going to take it because I just believe if God said it, it's possible for me to do it. Romans 8 gives us the mindset we're supposed to have. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Like what if a bunch of tough stuff starts happening? like tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no way. In, in every one of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is the mindset God wants to give us. Friends, you are not on defense, you're on offense. You are a child of the Most High God. God wants to call you to rise up and step into what he has for you because he loves you. When I was in third grade, I've told some of this story before, there was these older kids that bullied my friends. Again, this was back in the day where you had to sort your own stuff out, okay? (laughs) I talked to the teacher about it. She kind of like didn't say anything, let it go. So I went home to talk to my parents. Specifically, I went to talk to my mom about what was going on, on purpose. Just wanted her to coddle me. Mommy, these big guys are picking on my friends. Anyway, as I was talking to her, my dad overheard the conversation, walked in, and he said, hey, some older kids are picking on your friends. I said, yeah. He said, did you talk to the teacher about it? I said, yes, sir. He said, the teacher do anything about it? I said, no. He said, all right, you do something about it. And I said, that's why I wanted to talk to mom. Like I knew, I knew this is what was going to happen. And so I was like, okay, so the next day, all day, normally recess is like the best time for an elementary kid. But that day I was like, maybe we could just stay in class a little longer. I don't want to go out there because I know what's going to happen. And so we go out and sure enough, these kids, they circle up around my buddies and I'm standing on the outside and I'm at a crossroads. Do I take my chances with them or do I go home and take my chances with my dad? And I thought, I know how this story ends. I'm going this way. (laughs) I walked in, in the middle of them. As soon as I walk in the middle, my buddies ran off and fled. I thought, come on, guys, this is our moment. (laughs) They ran. It's just me standing in the midst of these guys. The alpha, like the ringleader. I knew if I I could get him, I can get all these guys. These are just pawns. This kid's the real kid, right? (laughs) So as he starts running his mouth, I ignore everything he's saying, and I just step forward and kick him right in the chest. (laughs) He goes down. When he goes down, his little pawns see him, and they run off and flee. He realizes he's alone. He gets off and runs away. And for like 10 seconds on the playground, I'm like, let's go. Let's go. (laughs) Until word gets back to me that these guys are regrouping. And now they're like, "Uh uh-uh, this is our turf. And that little third grade punk just like stood, nobody stands up to us. They're regrouping. They were going to come back in full force. And I thought, all I had was the surprise. Like, I don't have any other moves. (laughs) 
They know I'm willing to go there. So like, if they, like, what am I going to do if they come back? So that night I go home and I think this has gotten worse. They used to pick on my friends. Now they want to pick on me. Like what? Anyway, so I go to the playground the next day and we had this one kid in our class. He was the toughest kid in the whole school and everybody knew it. He was that kid that had the crazy growth spurt at like six months old, where like, <laughs> like in elementary, he's like, hey, you know, like that kid. His name was Ryan. Ryan comes up to me and he says, Ian. I'm like, yeah, <clears throat> sup, sup, Ryan. He's like, I heard about what you did. I was like, yeah. He goes, puts his arm around me, he goes, respect. He goes, I just want you to know, if anyone's got an issue with you, they got an issue with me. And then he looked up and he said, hey, Ian's with me. Don't touch him. I was like, let's go. Come on. Ryan's with me. The boldness that I walked with on that playground, like I own the play. I went to my buddies. I was like, hey, we ain't gonna have any problems anymore. Ryan's on our side now. And everybody, here's why I tell you that story that you didn't need to hear. If I could feel that confident as an elementary kid on a playground because some older kid had my back, how bold can you be? Because there's a God in heaven who, as the scripture says, loves you with all of his heart. And he's got your back and he's willing to fight for you. So if he calls you to rise up and take a step, take it to the glory of God because you're not taking it alone. He's got you and he loves you. That's the third thing Jesus wants to do. Last thing is this. People were astonished when they saw the blind see. People who had never had sight interact with Jesus and in a moment, their eyes are open. For us, what God wants to do is open our eyes to do two things. First, to see what matters most. We're living in it. You know this. You know this. It's easier than ever to be distracted, for your eyes to be on a million things that you miss out on what really matters most, to consume things, scroll through things that at the end of the day are worthless and irrelevant. And listen, it, like, like God's not against all that stuff, but if it starts to dominate your life, what happens is it turns your sight from your kids, your marriage to the purpose of God on your life, and it numbs you into living out the high call of God on your life. God wants to reorient our focus so that we can actually see what matters most so that our eyes can be open no longer to be deceived or tricked or enslaved by busyness and distraction that we're missing out on what God has for us. He wants to open our eyes. But the second thing, and more importantly, is this. He wants to open our eyes to see Jesus. These people who had never seen as their eyes were open, I don't know like how long that adjustment would have been, but as they start to take in light and color and wonder all at once, when their sight would have come into focus, the first things their eyes would have seen would have been the face of Jesus, no doubt smiling at them, the one who had just healed them and set them free. That's what your eyes were made for, to behold him, to see him. And in a time when things are shaky and uncertain, if you look at the world around you or even your own circumstances, you will feel very unstable and insecure because times change, circumstances change, things change. But when you fix your eyes on Jesus, he is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we look unto him, he produces in us like a rock solid stability because we know no matter what's happening out here, you are the same and your heart for me, your commitment for me, your love for me, it never changes. Even though my life might be like this, you are rock solid towards me. Second Corinthians three, our last verse for the day says this, we all with unveiled face, like our eyes have been opened we behold, what do we behold? Of all we could look at, what we're to focus on above all else is the glory of the Lord. We see Jesus. And when we do, we are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The older translations say we go from glory to glory. What's the idea? You really want to rise up. 
you want to go higher and higher with the Lord, look to Jesus. Fix your eyes on him in prayer, in worship, in digging into the word, going, God, I want to see you. Jesus, I want to be consumed with you. Because as you do, the Holy Spirit goes to work in your life to transform you so that you start to rise up and you don't even know what's happening. Because you're not even thinking about you. You're thinking about Jesus, fixing your eyes on him. God is raising you up. Friends, God's called us to rise up. But he wants to do a work in us so that we can, to give us a voice mostly with him, to make us healthy and whole from the inside out, to give us feet to walk into what he has for us, and to give us eyes to see what matters most, most of all, to see Jesus. When we do, and we step into this, the day will come that Jesus will say, come away, and we'll stand before him, and with a smile on his face, he will look at you, and he'll say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you for your people that you love with all of your heart. We're asking you to raise us up. You are the resurrection and the life. Apart from you, we can do nothing. We need you. And so we ask you to work in us like only you can. For people who need ministry, healing, and wholeness, I pray that you would release it into their heart, into their minds, even into their bodies, Lord. And we thank you for the wonderful testimonies of your work to raise us up so that we can be faithful, like you, Lord, to bear the fruit you've called us to bear, to play the part you've called us to play, to do the work you've made us to do. We thank you for it. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if you're here and you need to take the first step to go all in with Jesus, this is your moment to do so. All I'm going to do, I want to pray for you, but before I do, I want to know who you are. So I'm just going to count to three, and if that's you, I want you to throw your hand up and say, that's me. I need to make a real decision to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand. One, two, three. I already see you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Anybody else? So cool. That's awesome. We are so proud of you for taking that step. Jesus sees you, and he loves you with all of his heart. We're going to pray a prayer to invite Jesus to be first of all. I want you to pray this with us. We're all going to pray with you who raised your hands. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, here's my life. I give it to you. I'm all yours. Thank you for loving me, for saving me. Jesus, I believe in you, and I belong to you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me, receiving me into your own family forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, can we celebrate new life today? So cool.